understanding spiritual words, and the spiritual words are words taught by the Holy Spirit, contribute to a proper understanding of God. You can't understand God independently of words. Or Christ. You must have uh, words. God is mighty. God is great. God is gracious. God is love. God is merciful. See, words. Jesus is his great shepherd. He's the savior of the world. He's the way, the truth, and the life. All words. Words contribute to understanding. So a person, if they disdain words, they disdain knowledge because knowledge is comprised of words. Ideas and concepts are comprised of words. You take words out of the picture, you cannot understand or rise above the level of a brute beast. Words. In fact, you're... Uh, your idea about any form of reality, whether it's temporal or eternal, is determined by words. When I say apple, okay, you know what that what that means. That means something. Kingdom of God is on that level, but is on that same order, but on a much higher level. A weak spiritual vocabulary <coughs> will yield a minuscule or small and insignificant understanding. So if a person has a childlike vocabulary, they have a childlike understanding. Yes. That's why the, uh, the word of God has to be explained to children because it's too deep for the childlike mind. In fact, we're told, don't be children in understanding. That's, that's, that's an admonition for don't be children in understanding. And particularly, don't glorify God as though that was a virtue, because it is not. So we're looking at the word wait tonight. This word has a variety of meanings. Sometimes it means to serve. Now that's not waiting on tables. See, that's serving, but that's not how we're going to use it tonight. As you might expect, there's a multiplicity of, of uh, Hebrew and Greek words that are translated weight, which tells you that this is a very big, big word. Some of the meanings is used in the Old Testament scriptures for weight means to tarry or wait for, or to look and anticipatingly for something to come. Another meaning is to is to hope and tarry, but trust is a is a factor in in waiting. There's a waiting involves adhering to a course, sticking to it, not departing from it. Waiting has to do with waiting carefully, without wide alert, not being sloppy in the way the person lives. It has to do with being circumspect and serious and sober and attending to business at hand, watching intently. And it has to do with a quiet trust and silence, like be still, my soul. See, that's, that's all that's involved in waiting. So it's a very big, uh, as used in the Old Testament scriptures, as used in the, in the Gospels and in the Epistles, it involves much the same thing. It means to accept something as true and be willing to wait for it and look for it expectantly. Not wait for, like wait for a tornado that's on the way. That's not what we're talking about here. It's uh, expecting something, anticipating it, anxious for it to come, waiting. Expectation is a strong, strong, you know it's coming. You don't know when it's coming. So you, you wait for it to stay around where you know the thing's going to happen. When people were knew, knew that Jesus was going to be in a certain place, they'd go there and they'd wait wait for him, tarry for him. One day, one time, when they, toward the end of his ministry, they were observing a feast in Jerusalem, and they began to talk, I wonder if he's going to come to be at the feast. That's waiting expectantly. 
It, it's a, it has to do with waiting, expecting fully. That is, you're fully convinced of the thing you're waiting for. There's no question about it, no doubt about it. It's just the when. That's the only thing that's doubtful about it. And to, uh, and to look for it, to look for indications. That's why the apostles, they said, Jesus talked about the destruction of Jerusalem. He talked at the, in the same uh, dialogue, he talked about the end of the world. He talked about his own coming. He said, what's the signs? What are the signs of these things? What they were saying was, what, what can we look for so we, know it's, so we know it's near? That's waiting, see, expectantly. Now, in English, waiting means to stay in a place and remain inactive. That is, inactive doesn't mean without doing anything. It means not being distracted to lesser things in expectation of what's to come. That is, you're preparing yourself for what's coming, as well as looking forward to it. Now, let's, now let's explore this word a bit, <clears throat> wait. It's used in both uh, covenantal writings quite extensively. Here's some ways it's used. The first time it's used in Scripture is, is accounted to Job. He's the first person in the Bible that used this word, wait. Like I'm, like I'm using. I'm using wait in the sense of looking for something to happen. Expectantly, you're looking for it to happen. You're doing what's necessary so you won't be distracted from it coming, though you won't forget that it's coming. So whatever it's going to bring with it, you'll be ready for that occasion. All that's involved in waiting. And Job was the uh, first person to use this word. Here's what he said. If a man die, he wasn't opposing the possibility that a man wouldn't die. He's a point of reason. If a man die, shall he live again? I remember there was no Bible at this time. There's very little talk about recovering from death, if any at all, at this time. This was a mute, not a lot of revelation on it. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait Till my change come. Well, see, this is said without a whole lot of revelation. Amen. I'll wait, expecting this, all the days of my life. I know if a man lives again, he'll be changed. He reasoned that all out with a lot of, without a lot of scripture, without a Bible in his hand, or the law in his hand. He reasoned all that out. I'll wait, I'll wait. See, now you know how many people are not convinced the dead are going to be raised. They're willing to acknowledge you're going to die. In fact, they have little sayings like the two things for sure. You have to pay taxes and die. Well, you don't have to pay tax taxes. You don't have to pay them. You can go to jail. But you do have to die. You see, they don't talk about the resurrection. They don't say, but we know as we, two things we know for sure. This is what I didn't solve. They should say two things we know for sure. We're going to die and we're going to rise again. See, they don't say that at all. So they don't live in view of the resurrection because they don't believe that. That's a theory to many church people. If they would think seriously about the consequences of being raised from the dead and being changed, they would certainly live differently than they're living. Another way it's used in Scripture, Jacob, the patriarch Jacob used it. He remembered his grandfather Abraham talked about this. God told him several hundred years before, he told him that they were, the nation, the offspring of Abraham were going to go down into Egypt, stay there for 400, be in, afflicted for 400 years. Actually, they were down there 430 years, but there's no disparity here. The first 30 years were peaceable under Joseph's administration. See? The affliction was for 400 years, not the duration of the tenure in Egypt, the afflicts of 400 years, and Abraham told him, they're going to come out. Well, Jacob, he, didn't, he, didn't, he died before this happened. And here's what he said in Genesis 49, 18. I've waited for thy salvation, O Lord. <laughs> I've lived expecting this. And about the time he lived, this 400 years was kind of drawn to a close, you know. I've waited for your Salvation, that was deliverance. That was a deliverance from Egypt. I've waited for it. You revealed it, God. I've waited for your salvation. I didn't get caught up in the heathen society. When I moved to Egypt, I didn't become an Egyptian. 
I waited for your salvation. I lived for that time that I was 